beautiful job this morning. It is a delight to see you here today. We're in Acts chapter 28. This is the last page of the first book of history of the church, the book of Acts. We've gone from chapter 13 where we began the missionary journey with Paul from chapter 13 of Acts. Now to chapter 28, we finish the great, great book and the great story of these missionary journeys. If you're a visitor with us today, we, as Pastor Betty's already said, we thank you for being here. And it's more than, it means so much more to us than you know. It really does for you to, to, to come and be with us. I got to meet the Haygoods this morning, their first time here, and uh, been listening to us on video uh, all the way through these months and all. It's a delight to see you. And Maria, so good to have you with us and look forward to marrying y'all. When is that? Of this year? Oh, okay. We look forward to that. I'm glad you reminded me. What a blessing. Well, in Acts 13, it all starts. He had a sorcerer that was demon-possessed that followed him around. He got tired of that, and he cast the demons out of her. And then he went to Iconium. This is Paul. And that's the first time they tried to stone him to death. Then he went to Lystra and healed a man there. The Antioch, the Antioch folks were so upset. They stoned him and dragged him out of the city. Then he came, uh, that was in Lystra, he came to Antioch and the whole city was stirred up because he mentioned that you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. And uh, the religious crowd caught him and tried to kill him again, let him out by a basket and he got out of town. Acts 16, he was beaten with rods and then cast into prison. And there an earthquake got him, and it loosed his bonds, and many people were saved because of that. Acts 17, he went to Berea, had to leave under cover of darkness because they were looking for him. They got him to Athens where he was sent to court again. Acts chapter 19, there was a riot in Ephesus. Now here's the thing about the Apostle Paul. He can't get along with anybody. I mean, everywhere he goes, this happens. Uh, Alexander the coppersmith, uh, the silversmith, uh, they added it up and they said, Paul, you owe us 50,000 pieces of silver because that many uh, heard the gospel and they smashed all of the shrines and all of the idols that they had. And he said, you owe us 50 grand. Acts chapter 20, he was bound in chains. And this is where he calls the church together and he says, stop this crying and whining about what's going on. I will be bound in chains, but he said, but none of these things move me, neither count I lie, my life dear unto myself. Now, can you imagine this witness that's going on? Acts 21, the temple, he goes there in Jerusalem. They dragged him out, they beat him, put him back in prison. And this is where Felix, um, our Festus, tries to make a deal with him because they had, the Jewish leaders got with him and said, send him back to Jerusalem. We want to try him again. So he said, will you go to Jerusalem and be tried? He said, I've done nothing wrong in Jerusalem. I'm going to, to Rome. Acts 23, they brought him to the Sanhedrin uh, because they, they feared um, he was going to be put to death. So the Sanhedrin, they voted and split right down the middle because uh, the Pharisees believed there would be a resurrection. The, the Sadducees did not. So they got into a big fight over him. A centurion heard Paul's nephew tell him what was being planned. So he took 200 soldiers, 100 horsemen, 200 spearmen to protect this one, one Jewish preacher to get him out of town. And there he makes his way back to Felix's court. And they send him to Rome. Acts 25, the Jewish leaders set an ambush. Forty, 40 men say, we will not eat nor will we uh, drink anything until we have killed this man called Paul. Acts 25, the Jewish leaders set another ambush for him. The 40 guys, they never did make it. Acts 26, he goes back to court. Acts 27, they're in a ship. They're sending him to Rome. Eurekladon comes up, that great southeast wind, 14 days, 14 nights. They do not see the sun. The wind never stops. The rain never stops. He tells them, don't worry about it. We're all going to be okay. You're going to lose the ship. Ship breaks apart after 14 days and everything gets lost. And we're in Acts chapter 28. <sighs> now, when they had escaped, 
Then they found out that the island was called Malta. They've escaped that. Now, we were left off last week. They were swimming on boards to the shore. You remember that? And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the bundle of fire, a viper came out of the heat and fastened on his hand. That's why this sermon is called, Are You Kidding Me? I have come through everything I just said. I swam to shore on a board. I'm going to die by a snake bite. Are you kidding me? Now, this is a, a, a little bitty island called Malta. There are no snakes there, but there were there uh, 2,000 years ago, several different poisonous snakes. Many people write a lot about what this all means. It doesn't mean anything outside of there are no snakes now, but there were snakes then. And listen, we knew that, that, that this was the kind of snake that was going to kill you because the, the natives to the island said, uh-oh, he's about to die. And so uh, they watched this and they said, well, he must have been a murderer because God's going to judge him after everything he's been through. Are you kidding me? Is this the way I'm going to go out? Everything I've been through, and this is what happens. We're going to give you four little teaching points today. The first was called the bite of the serpent. The, the serpent in Scripture has always been a bad thing. You go all the way back to Adam and Eve, where the bite of the serpent was not through, through the, the teeth, but it was through the lie. The bite of the serpent has always been, yea, hath God said. The first words of the devil in the scripture is, God didn't really mean what he said. The bite of the, of the serpent today is that of the lie of the serpent, who is saying, saying to a, a, a modern, a super modern, cool generation, you don't need God. You don't need Jesus. You don't need salvation. You can make it on your own. We're all okay. That's the bite of the serpent today. It's a lie. The bite of the serpent comes uh, as well in the wilderness where uh, the, the pole was put uh, up so if you would look and you could believe because they were being bitten everywhere by these serpents. The bite of the serpent meant absolutely nothing to Paul because he was headed to Rome and he knew it. Well, he must be a robber. He must be a murderer because he's being judged after everything that he's been through. I don't know where you are today, where you are in your life today, but talking to so many of you, Preston's been sick, his family's been sick, COVID, uh, everyone in the wedding party was sick. I mean, it just, it just seems sometimes like life is piling on, doesn't it? You may be saying this morning, are you kidding me? This is next. You may walk out of here and see a flat tire and say, are you kidding me? Everything I've been through. We've all been to a point in our life, and you may be right there now where, where you're beginning to say, are you kidding me, Lord? Is there one more thing that's going to happen to me? The bite of the serpent, though, is one reminder. And, and they look at him and said, he's a murderer. He's going to be judged. And then uh, a few hours go by. Uh, he's not a murderer. He's a god. He goes, He's going to live through this. But that's the pagan mindset. The bite of the serpent meant absolutely nothing to Paul. In fact, he just went on. I love the servant heart of Paul. Uh, he's over there trying to get the fire. Everybody's cold, and he's trying to get the fire stoked up so they can warm up, and it's raining. And the bite of the serpent then, uh, if you look in the first five verses, but he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they looked for a long time and saw no harm coming, they changed their mind and said, He's a God. In that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. The bite of the serpent has always been Satan's lie of where you are and what this means. I think we have an entire generation that, are, that is literally hooked into the lie today. The, the lie that you do not need salvation. There is no need for regeneration of the heart. There is no need for a church today. When the governor of California can say, listen, shut your churches down, you have no influence anyway. And that's not true. It's the, that's the bite of the serpent. That's the lie. Great influence. Churches have great influence in every community. And, and many communities are willing to just forego that and say, okay, we won't have influence anymore. 
I thank God, though, that we're living in a time when we understand that the bite of the serpent is nothing but a lie. We're not falling for it. We're going to serve him. We're going to love him. We're going to honor him. We're going to have the church doors open. We're going to have y'all uh, taken and receiving the, the gifts and the offerings because that is who we are. That is what we do. The bite of the serpent is a lie. It's always been a lie. Therefore, we will not surrender any of this. We will not give up. We will not have any part of this lie that says y'all need to quit. Your snake bit. Now, folks, if you only knew, if you only knew what yet is to come, where we will go. And this is, again, Paul reminds the people, that, listen, we will not be derailed by the bite of the serpent. He just shook it off and went on about his stuff. Why? Because the angel came to him in the ship during the 14-day storm and said, you're going to Rome. You have to take the word of God literally into your heart and apply it there. He's got a purpose for you, and you're not going to be detained. You're not going to be distracted. Verse 7, 8, 9, and 10 uh, moves from the bite of the serpent to the blessing of the saints. They entertained us courteously. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever. Paul went into him, prayed. He laid hands on him and healed him. When this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. Every distraction you're in, every island that God puts you on is your place to serve him. You are here, serve him here, serve him now. You're, you're not going to be worried. And, th and that's the thing about, uh, I, I get messages from missionaries every day of my life. And there's great need, I know that. Sometimes I just have to look the other way at the message, knowing that, that there's a great need. But there'll be a greater need tomorrow. I, I understand that. But the bite of the serpent has, has us in a missionary age when we're thinking, eh, it's not as important as it used to be. It's not that big a deal to be a missionary. It's not that important to build a church. It's not that important. But I'm telling you, the bite of the serpent is reminding us over and over and over and over again how important the local church is in community. Well, blessing of the saints. We're to be a blessing. And it says that we, uh, we stayed there for many days. They honored us, verse 10, in many ways. And when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. That's the blessing of of the saints by the serpents just a big lie don't get don't buy but the blessing of the saints is wherever you're planted you need to grow you need to bloom you need to be uh, prospering in the lord by giving to others and so the blessing of the saints wherever we are shipwreck god's people are good and you know that's one thing i found didn't matter what part of the world i was in the thing that i always found true god's people are good no matter where you are they may not speak your language. I've been in situations where the person translating didn't understand the language that, that they were, and they had to have a different translator translate to them, just, and that was just saying hello, They're trying to get everybody on board. But it didn't matter what you could speak or where you could not speak. God's people are good. The first time I, I found out that hallelujah was an untranslatable word, that it didn't matter what language it is, more than 200 and some odd different languages, it doesn't matter. Hallelujah is hallelujah. In Portuguese, it's hallelujah. In Spanish, it's hallelujah. In English, it's hallelujah. In Arabic, it's hallelujah. And uh, the, the blessing of knowing that God's people are good all over the world is a reminder of the blessing of the saints. You know, y'all are a blessing Every, uh, to me every week of my life you're a blessing every month of my life you're a blessing that's what you're designed to do did you realize that you were designed to be a blessing looking for opportunities by which you can serve looking for opportunities by which you can give looking for opportunities that's the blessing of the saints and it says that oh Publius, uh he didn't know who they were he just knew he, he came in and prayed over his father his father's healed these are god's people preached to them uh, from the, the Roman uh, house that he's going to where the great people are, the big people, the, the fancy people, or the deserted island of Malta, God's people are good. You ought to look around today and, you know, and look at one another and say, you know what, God is good to us. And we've just come through Thanksgiving. I don't know what it was like for you, but... Uh, it was the first time in three or four years our entire family got together, had all the grandsons, all the granddaughters. And it's the first time in our history as a family that when the day ended, there was no food left, none. <laughs> Absolutely. There was no ham left. There was no turkey left. There was no mashed potatoes and gravy left. There was no sweet potato casserole. There was no dressing left. 
no mac, uh, mac and cheese, five cheese mac and cheese baked in a pan this long. There was nothing. One of the grandsons came over the next morning and looked in the refrigerator and said, where is it? It's gone. That was a real blessing. We had hamburgers the next day. But when we get together and we thank God for one another, one of the reasons of being in church is to remind ourselves that that's what we do. We're to thank God that we have each other. Thank God that we can be a blessing everywhere we go. The blessing of the saints. We were honored in many ways when we departed. They provided such things as was necessary. It is the job of the church to provide what's necessary. That's our job. And that's the blessing. What's necessary? And that's not necessarily what you need, and I don't need a thing. Uh, we try to figure out whether trade names at Christmas or the Santa Claus thing where you take, get a good gift and then somebody steals it back from you. I don't think that's a Christian game at all. I always lose out on those deals. Uh, Santa, Santa, whatever the Santa game. Whatever. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the longer that I live on this planet, the more I don't care about any of that. I just enjoy the sound. In fact, the only thing I did much on Thanksgiving is this. I just held my camera up and put a video on and just let it roll. The laughter, the funny stories, the silly things going on, because I want to be able to hear that in the dark of some night when I've forgotten the blessing of the people is the laughter and the love that we experience with one another. That's a good reason to have donuts and coffee on Sunday morning, if nothing else. I've met three families today that I didn't know and uh, got over donuts and coffee. Uh, just enjoy being a blessing, the, the blessing of the saints. Verse 11 now. After three months we sailed in an, an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers which had wintered at the island. We're going to talk about the brothers sailing. These twin brothers are the, the Greek sons of Zeus. Their names are Castor and Pulux. Castor and Pulux. You know... Everything about Paul, under the sovereign grace of God, he's going to Rome, he's getting a free bus ticket, being paid for by the government all the way, but he did pay a high price. He's been beaten up uh, three different times, he's been stoned two different times. His health is now gone because of what all they've gone. He was able to swim to shore, able to be a snake bit, and now he is riding in a pagan boat. The twin brothers are Castor and Pollux. And they were the gods of navigation. And I know he's sitting back on the back of that ship laughing as he sees these two big heads of these false gods. And, and the gods of navigation. Sometimes the world believes that they are in control and that they are, uh, uh, d are d divinely guiding us and that they are navigating our course. I don't know if you heard yesterday, South Africa and seven other different nations, a new variant again, and it's got the news media. I tell you, they love this stuff. There's another variant, and we're all going to die this time. They're all, we're gonna, now we're going to shut down again, and it's come to find out that the, uh, the, the vaccines are not going to be effective against the new variant, and they're working hopefully in three, two to three months. They'll have another um, vaccine that'll be ready, that'll help. Do you see where this may be going, folks? This is never going to end. It's never going to shut down. At some point, sooner or later, and I know whether or not you've had it or didn't have it or had it the first time, but trust me, you're going to have it the second and the third time. It's not going anywhere. But they are not in charge of our navigation. This is a pagan, lost, dying culture that is absolutely broken, and they believe they're in charge. We're riding in a boat sometimes that is navigated by the world. We're riding in a boat that is navigated by those who don't love Christ, who don't know of salvation, who don't know the, of the eternal doctrine of the blood of Christ and the atonement that he has given for us. But we're in that boat, but we know where we're going. It may be navigated by Pollock and Castor, but we have a heavenly destination at the end of this deal that Pollock and Castor know nothing about. Okay, we'll ride on their boat to get to Rome. But when we get off, we understand we're in the hand of God. Paul is no different than every one of us. When we're the brothers sailing here, the twin brothers, and they're the twin brothers of navigation, and, and the world always felt better if they could see this twin-headed God up on the front of the boat because 
There we've got safety, and there we've got security. As our president said last week, America just needs to trust our government. Okay, thank you for that. Great. Yeah, yeah we sure. Just need to trust us. We know where we're going. That's the false-headed God of navigation. We know where we're going. My final destination is not what happens to me on this earth. My redemption requires me to have a presence with God. Part of my inheritance of being filled with the Holy Spirit is that this is just a down payment. And when I get to heaven, when you get to heaven, we're going to see, as we have never seen before, what God is really like, what heaven is really like, and all those people we've lost along the trail, what it's going to be like. Sean, you want me to stop and you translate that all to Maria again? Can you get that all? <laughs> The presence of the Holy Spirit in our life is our navigational ship, even though we're in a boat that we don't want to be in right now. The brothers sailing remind us that we're not always in charge of the directional flow of life, but our Heavenly Father always is. One last point that we'll make to, uh, beginning in verse 20, uh, 17. And the, after this came to pass three more days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together now, he's, he is in Rome. He's locked up. The Praetorian Guard have him. They take turns. But, uh, you know, this is for two years now that this has been going on. When they came together, he said to them, Men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, wanted to let me go because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you. Now, this is the, the legal guardians of the Jewish nation, all right? I have called for you to see you and speak with you because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with chains. Our final teaching point, bound to the Scripture. Bound to the Scripture. I am bound with this chain. Now, when I read this answer, you maybe have never seen it like I'm about to say it. Then they said to him, We neither have received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you. Paul, there are no charges against you. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I can just see Paul sitting there, all of this, and there are no charges. The Jewish nation brings against you no charge. So the chain that he was bound to was not that of the Roman government nor of the Jewish nation. Paul was bound by a heavier chain. He was bound by the Scripture. You say, would God do that? Are you kidding me? Would God do that? Are you kidding me? Everything that I'm going through, would God allow this to happen in my life? Are you kidding me? Are you seriously, are you seriously saying all of this, the shipwreck, I've been beaten to death, I've been stoned, and they're now, they've called off all the charges, there is nothing to lay before the official Jewish court, there's not a thing in the world. No, sure not. I am bound with this chain. Then they said, we neither have received letters. There is no charge. But we desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, the way, the group of Christians, this is what they were called, the way. We know that it is spoken of against everywhere. So when they had pointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophets, and from morning until evening. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophet of our father, saying this, Go to this people and say, hearing you will hear, hearing you will hear, but shall not understand. 
And seeing, you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their hearts. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute amongst themselves. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, and no one forbade him. Bound to the scripture. For two more years, many Jewish leaders become believers because of this. There are no charges laid against him. And for two years, he understands that I will be locked up, but I am bound to a deeper cause. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I are bound to a deeper chain than what the world has. Please do not let what's going to come out in the next 100 days, the next 200 or 300 days, the next election of the midterms and all of this thing, do not allow these events to capture and distract you. That's the bite of the serpent. You are bound to a much larger and grander cause, the cause of God's scripture. If the church does not get back, and I'm talking about the American church, we at one point were the missionary central headquarters to the universe. In Colorado Springs alone, there are 17 different international missionary organizations. International. In one city alone. And today, missionaries are being sent from um, South Korea and from South America to America to help bring a missionary cause back to this country. And it's because we've lost the missionary zeal. We've lost the importance. And we feel like all the next events are going to hit us and hamper us to the point that we're bound to the chain that is being driven by the false gods of Pollock and Castor saying, this is the direction we're going. We may be headed in that direction, but that's not our destination. Do not lose your purpose. You are bound to a greater chain than life circumstances. I don't care how sick you're going to get. I don't care how much you lack having any toilet paper. I don't care what it's going to come to if green peas are out. And by the way, uh, Walmart was out of spaghetti, dried spaghetti this week. Now, how does that happen? I don't know. We, just, we need to put it down. I'm telling you, this is the end of the age. This is what, this is what they were talking about in the Great Tribulation. You run out of spaghetti. <laughs> this is how distracted the American church is. We are bound. We are bound. And for every believing person who is at home today and has to be there, we pray for you. We really do. But for every believing Christian who is not in church and should be, shame on you. Shame on you. This is the chain I am bound to. For the love of Christ constrains us. We are bound to the scripture, folks. Last week we talked about staying the course because it's getting rough. Just don't be distracted by the bite of the serpent. It's a lie. It is a lie. I'm telling you, at what point, I was talking to a young minister two weeks ago. He said, well, you're talking about all the news media. At what point do you believe them? I said, okay, it's real. when you hit that remote and you turn it on, stop believing at that point. Because that's how bad it is. We, we may be listening to you. We may have to ride in your boat a little while, but we're navigated by the Holy Spirit. And that's where we're going to go out. The bite of the serpent. I've almost been snake bitten. And if you have been snake bitten, you know that there is not just a physical pain to it. There is a psychological thing that happens as well. I've been close to being snake bitten. I've jumped on several, jumped down on the cotton mouths before, kicked a rattlesnake out, been close to being snake bit. There's just something from Genesis on with the serpent. Well, folks, we got to pay attention to that thing. We have to pay attention. I was wet out in western Oklahoma with a couple of cousins that lived there. We were shooting rattlesnakes with pistols. By the time I got to the house, 
And I was just a little kid. I'll, I'll never forget that. I mean, I didn't sleep all that. I had my feet up on the bed. I was looking around all night long for, for rattlesnakes. There's something psychological about the bite of the serpent. But you know what? The prophecy was that Jesus' heel comes down upon the head of the snake and he crushes all the lie. So stay the course. Are you kidding me? So the next time you hear that someone saying, are you kidding me? Think, hey, folks, it's not the end. It may be in the boat. You may not want to be here. It's not the end. Are you kidding me? Let's pray. Father, the bite of the serpent is catching us today. It's a lie. It's saying to us the church is, is out of place and it's out of date. No more reason to exist. We need to listen to the state and sit down and shut up. Father, we know it's a lie. We ride in a boat with Castor and Pulox who want a destination that is not for us. So while we may have to hook a ride, I pray that you give us grace. Lord, this little section about the blessing of the saints that provided whatever was necessary, may we get that part today. That everyone who walked in here, whether it was a help of a cane, a walker, a wheelchair, or two good feet, or one good foot, one bad knee, or two good knees, however you got us in these doors, we can be a blessing to others if we'll just open our heart to it. Whatever was the need, they were happy to help. Thank you, Jesus, for these people who love you. I thank you for those who are at home who have to be. I thank you for those, Heavenly Father, who want to serve you. I give them a place. I pray that they'll just open the doors of their heart. But for, Lord, those sitting in this room today who've, who have the, received the bite of the serpent, they are discouraged. They are distracted. They find no help, no hope. They sense no redemption. I pray, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit will help them this very day. In Jesus' name. I'd like for you to stand together with me. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If this were a day that you say, you know what, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. I need to, I need to come. I need to be baptized. I need to be saved. I need to confess my sins to Jesus Christ. Then this invitation is for you. But if you're a believer in this room, and that little part of the Scripture who said the blessing of the saints was that they provided whatever need that they saw, maybe you need to re-energize your soul this morning of saying, you know what, I've got to get my eyes open again. I've got to get my eyes open to people. I've got to get my eyes open to, to needs of others. I've got to get my eyes open to my family, what they need. Then this, this altar is for you as well. However the Lord leads in your heart today, you act upon it. Don't remember.